Oh, it's like... Um, hello, and thank you, and welcome, thank you for coming along, and welcome to the first talk in a series of talks by creative entrepreneurs. Um, this is going to be given today by James Morris. Um, I have put together this program of 10 creative entrepreneurs, people who had an idea, a creative idea, and did whatever it took to make that idea work, to be successful in whatever, whatever way that means. And um, the series will take place over the months from November to April. And so this is the first one, and the last one will be in April, and that will be Moya Doherty from Riverdance. Um, this, the lecture series is a partnership between the new MPhil that I'm running, which is in creative and cultural entrepreneurship, in partnership with Goldsmith, and uh, it's a collaboration between the Science Gallery and the Long Room Hub. And I felt that that's an important collaboration because the Science Gallery is science, and the Long Room Hub is a humanities research institute. So the lectures will alternate. So we will start off in the Science Gallery, and the next lecture in two weeks, which will be nine or nine, will be in the Long Room Hub. So they will alternate, and um, all of the lectures are bookable on the Science Gallery website. So I hope you'll all come along, and I hope, hope you'll enjoy the talks. Um, I want to introduce you today to James Morris. Um, James is a, a, a very, very unusual creative entrepreneur. He went to Trinity, and he studied history. And when he left college, and he will tell you his entire story today, he, um, he founded Windmill Lane Production and uh, Post-Production and Films. Um, he's also been very successful in setting up uh, The Mill in London, and he did that in partnership with Paul McGuinness and U2. And um, the, um, his, latest, uh, his latest venture is into VFX, which is special effects for film. And James has set up a new studio, which is um, complementary to Windmill Lane Post Productions, and they're both in the kind of post-production area in uh, Dublin 2. So I'd like you to introduce James. He will talk, and then after that, we'll have a question and answer series. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, afternoon. Um, I'm, uh, well, I started off by reading the brief. The brief is, uh, tell your story from the beginning, uh, how you developed your ideas, and share your plans for the future. So um, I've got quite a long period of time to cover, um, 40 years or more. So I'm going to crack on and hopefully uh, don't get too stuck in detail. Um, I'm going to start actually with Trinity. Um, as Mary said, I, did, I arrived here uh, to study history and political science. Uh, I spent four years doing that. Um, it, it was a formative time, definitely, for me. Um, but I suppose central to my time at Trinity was Trinity Players. I signed up in Freshers' Week. I had a little background, I, I started doing stage lighting, got into players, and that sort of led me down a number of routes which kept me pretty busy for four years with the occasional bit of study. And um, it was, I suppose for me, it was a kind of an you know, explosion of a horizon, you know, making new friends, meeting people from you know, all over the world and all, all sorts of different backgrounds. And so, but there was a community in players, and it sort of led me into, um, as I say, doing lighting. I mean, one of the things that uh, we used to do then was uh, people, the reviews were popular, student reviews, you know, which were supposed to be satirical. And um, there, there, was a, there was an arrangement whereby the Trinity Review would do a late night version of itself at the Wexford Opera Festival. So that was one of my first experiences within the first two weeks was to be doing a late night review in Wexford, which was an odd experience, but very, um, very self-improving, I feel. And I then moved on uh, w with that sort of involvement in players. Um, I suppose, um, you know, a, a big thing for me was uh, I, I had, you know, as a, you know, when I had been at school, I studied music. I had not been a very uh, particularly accomplished musician, but I had studied the violin. And uh, it, this was in the sort of uh, late 60s, so uh, I decided that being in a band would be a pretty good social move. And I met up with a guy called um, <laughs> Sean Davey, who some of you may know, he is a real musician. And the two has formed a band called Blues Assembly which was a gigging band. It was a beat scene in Dublin that time. We used to play down O'Connell Street, uh, and, um, and there were bands around like Granny's Intentions and Mojo and the Uptown Band, and it was a real beat scene. 
uh, and it was sort of underground compared to the show band scene. This is all ancient history for everyone here, I know, but anyway, I'll keep... I'll, get through this quickly. Um, another thing we had because of reviews, myself and a, another friend I made there called Richard Feig, and uh, he, we used to write scripts for a, an RTE comedy show. Well, it, was a, it wasn't very comic, but it was the Mike Murphy show, and we wrote sketches for him. So I managed to sort of get the idea of, you know, getting a bit of extra money from, uh, we were played, we had a residency in the band in a place called the Boot Inn out by the air, airport, and we were, you know, a real blues band. It's, it's not the most challenging music uh, if you're not the most brilliant musician. But, uh, it definitely was, uh, kept us very busy. So um, the sort of study side of life was, um, was history. I, I had, when I arrived, I had this idea that, you know, for me, sort of literature might be what I wanted. So I went along to the head of the history, who was uh, Professor Moody, and I said, oh, I, is there any chance I could change from history to English? And he said, why? He said, well, I, I just always thought that literature was sort of right for me. And he said, well, if you're that keen on books, why don't you read them? You're going to stay doing history. <laughs> um, and actually, it probably turned out to be a good thing for me. So um, as I say, the time went very quickly. Uh, I involved in all of these. And at the end of four years, I got a 2-2 degree, which for me was a, quite an achievement. So and then suddenly, of course, it was like what to do. A bit of a panic set in. You know, all the friends I'd made, everything that I sort of took for granted on a daily basis, and it was over, really. Uh, so um, my idea at the time was, well, I'd like to carry on doing what I was doing. It seems to me fine with me. I was able to make a few sort of a bit of income through a bit of music, a bit of writing scripts and things. Um, but anyway, I, I did go to a couple of, uh, in those days, big co corporations did reviews to sort of, you know, cherry pick the best students. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't one of their choices. So I then did an HDIP ed in Trinity, and that was, a, that was a big change. I went into doing teaching practice at a school called Sutton Park School, which was a very um, different school in Dublin in those days. I had a very inspirational headmaster, Rook Garn, and he, well, I won't go into the whole educational thing, but anyway, I, at the end of that year, I decided that you know, music wasn't, uh, sorry, teaching wasn't really my vocation, uh, but, um, I had been doing a bit of, I'd carried on with the music, Sean and I had done our band, and towards the end of my dip head, we sent, we'd recorded some tapes with a musician called Donal Lully in his, um, in his flat, and those days students had flats in places like Marion Square for a few pounds a week, and so uh, we sent them off to some publishing companies in London, and um, a, uh, there were no mobile phones or anything like that, we just posted them. Uh, and then we, we got a letter saying, Mr. Ivan Chandler will be arriving on such and such a date in Dublin and wants to meet you. This is from April Music, which is the CBS publishing company. So we arrived up and Ivan Chandler said, hello, lads. Um, and he said, uh, we like your tapes. Um, I've suddenly gone from London to Australia. <laughs> and <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, he took us out to the Burnie Inn, which was at the top of uh, Nassau Street in those days. Uh, I think it's Lily's Bordello's now. But, uh, he, and we had a glass of red wine, and he produced a contract. He said, now just sign here, will you? So we did. Uh, we signed the contract. No such thing as lawyers in those days. And um, he gave us money. And so I went up to McCullough Pickett's in Suffolk Street and bought a Fender Jazz bass, and Sean uh, put his money in the bank. And um, they took us over to, um, to London. Uh, and so I suppose, you know, uh, sort of from you know, a, a student life which was for me very full and very involved in sort of lots of doing things which just, you know, were uh, fun to do and with friends, um, but also trying to kind of, you know, create something from time to time, um, whether it would be working in a theatrical um, event or with music. So anyway, th this, this whole thing happened rather quickly. We decided to go over to London and they paid us uh, by those days really quite good money. We were given at what's called an advance. Now you sign an extraordinary contract, which means that you're more or less tied to them to keep working, writing songs for, for five years. You have to produce 200 songs a year, but you do get enough to live on. And um, so we made, so anyway, we went over there and we worked away writing songs. I should explain that Sean is a real musical talent. We were a good team. I was quite good at the chat and um, we kind of made our way in the kind of London music over there. And we went into a studio called uh, Nova Sound, which was a big recording studio at the time, and the record company got a producer on, but a very professional producer, and we made an album, um, and it had some, some great musicians on it, and it was mostly, it was 99% Sean's talent in music, but, you know, I played the violin, I played the bass, and I sang a few harmonies. 
Um, and at the end of that experience, I resigned from the band because uh, what the one thing I discovered was that if you're in a recording studio, there's no place to hide. Everything you do is recorded, repeated, uh, and if you're not very good, everyone can hear it. So <laughs> I'm not taking a noble route here, but it just seemed to me that music wasn't really going to work. So um, Sean came back to Dublin, and he's since wrote great pieces like The Brendan Voyage, which are played in National Constable, and so on. But our album uh, unfortunately sank without trace because Decca, who released it, went on strike the week of the release. Uh, it did get some good reviews. Uh, I think it's a great album. Sean doesn't often very often mention it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, um, so, th so having done that, I was over in London, and um, I mean, I should say that, there were, that it never was, occurred to me or most of the people I was with at the time that there was any work going in Dublin. So uh, having done the dip head and sort of delayed the sort of moment of having to support yourself, got over to London. Uh, again, a friend from Dublin had, been, had worked in an ad agency, said, if you, why don't you try film? Soho in London, they have, uh, there are production companies there. I know one that makes commercials. He introduced me to that company. And I, I went in, and I have to say, the basement, they had the film editing uh, rooms. And it was, I think for me, the first moment I really thought, this is, uh, this is perfect. This is just what I want to do. Uh, something about editing, which is uh, totally absorbing. You're telling a story, um, but you're sort of working with film, and it's quite physical and, and everything. So it just had instant appeal for me. And so I, I said to the editor and his assistant, a guy called Andrew Veer, I said, look, um, can I sort of come in as an intern? You don't have to pay me. And he sort of anyway, he said, all right. So I went in. Anyway, I got on with them. And I said, look, there's no job as an assistant, he said to me, but I can get you into the accounts department. So the first job I ever had in the film industry was working in the accounts department of a commercials company, having to ring people up to ask them to pay money. It's a good lesson. Um, and, uh, but then a vacancy occurred. I got in to be an assistant editor uh, in the editing room. And I started learning about film. Uh, and I, this was a sort of steps that would, you know, my first sort of I suppose um, work, part of working life was I, I became a film editor. Now, uh, but before that happened, I, um, I had uh, Richard Fegan, who we'd done scripts with, me and my pal, he came over as well, and he said, look, um, how about writing scripts? I'd inherited uh, 5,000 from a granny, and I could live for uh, a year uh, without working. So I sort of quit the job. I went off with Richard Fegan. We started writing scripts. We, we got some accepted as sketches on the BBC for a, a weekly a show called Weekending, but it didn't really work. Now, he himself has gone on to be a great... He, he teamed up with another trinity, Andrew Norris. They wrote things like The British Empire. They've been writing sort of sitcoms for the BBC and ITV for the last 30 years. And so, you know, again, I was attached to somebody who was brilliant at it. We were a good team, but it, it wasn't really for me. So at the end of that, I got a job back in a film editing company. And this time it was a place called Roger Charles, which was the sort of post-production company in London. And it was doing work for people like Alan Parker. And I was doing assistant work on the film Bugsy Malone and those type of things. It was a, you know, very fast learning. And so after two years of working, I got my work my up to be a film editor, and I got a, an offer of two, offer, two offers, really. One offer was uh, Andrew Veer, who'd given me my first job. He was setting up his own ed editing company. He said, come and join me. You know, I'll make you a partner and all that. And then a, a good friend I'd made in Cheryl's uh, said we were doing uh, work for Adrian Lyne, who again has become a big director, but his company, Jenny & Co., why don't you leave and join us? And so I, I kind of was confronted, really, for the first sort of proper decision I actually had to make, because um, either of those was going to be a big commitment uh, for me to sort of say, yes, I'll do that, and sort of you know, do it with other people. And um, so I turned them both down. And, and that was actually for personal reasons. And I suppose, you know, when I think about it, uh, it was, um, <laughs> you know, I suppose the reason was, uh, I wrote it down here. I, I know there was a good reason. Um, and I tried, to, I tried to avoid it. I think it was really, yes, <laughs> it was an attempt to settle my identity crisis. I mean, I suppose for me, you know, I had, um, I mean, without going too far into this, my, my father was, you know, f family comes from Connemara. My grandfather was born in the house there. My dad was born in Dublin in 1913. He's Catholic. Um, he was, he became a, a, a soldier in the British Army, but in an Irish regiment. So as a family, we used to move around. We were based in Armagh, the Royal Irish Fusiliers. We lived in Rome. My brother was born in Berlin. So we were an army family in the British Army, but with an Irish background. And I think choosing Trinity was, uh, you know, a, an indication of, you know, how do I settle, you know, because having, I was also went to a boarding school in England, um, place uh, in Yorkshire, and I would come back and have holidays in Connemara. And so 
And all of that came to the head for me when I was um, sort of making that decision. Do I really want to stay in London now for the next, you know, probably foreseeable future, building a career in one of these two opportunities or wherever that might lead? So I decided to not do that and to come back to Dublin. And I had no job offer or anything. I just came back and thought, well, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it from here. And that, I think, was um, more about kind of trying to resolve my own sense of identity. So um, anyway, I knew one person who was working here, a man called David Shaw Smith, who was a filmmaker who made his own films. They're, they're actually on air again now. They're called Hands. And he was, he was making films about sort of crafts and artisan uh, skills all over Ireland back, back in, in, you know, in the 70s, actually. And they were, they're now they're, they're fine pieces, uh, and they are being re-released by RTE now. They've been sort of re-transferred onto high def and all the rest of it. So um, he introduced me to the only freelance editor in Dublin at the time, Rory O'Farrell, and I said, look, I'm actually an editor. You know, got any work? And he said, yes, but um, I, you know, we, I do work for RTE. RTE works on 16 mil. You've been working on 35 millimeter. I'm not sure they'll accept your qualifications. So I had to take a step back and go syncing up rushes for editors and RTE. But I soon... Um, you know, got beyond that and started editing little pieces. But then an event happened, and in the next door house to where we were was a man called Tiernan McBride. Tiernan, in my opinion, is really one of the founders of the Irish film industry, of what is now called the Irish film industry. Tiernan, son of Sean McBride, famous uh, Sean McBride, he was a commercials director, and he... I got to know him. We all, we all went down to the Cork Film Festival one year, and... Um, the Australians were there who had done Picnic at Hanging Rock, which was a sensation that an Australian film could be a commercial success. And we were sitting in a bar with them, and they started telling the story about how they had made the Australian film industry work. And essentially, they had a similar situation where TV commercials for Australia were made by American directors who would fly in, do the work for Australian agencies, and fly out. He said, we did it in Australia which meant that they just, uh, using a union, they banned all non-Australian crews for making uh, Australian commercials. And that created sufficient economic base for the whole industry, uh, for people to make a living, for all of the skills needed, which are the same as for making films, used for making commercials. It created an industry. Uh, so Tiernan came back and he thought, well, that's a great idea. And he went off to the uh, Liberty Hall, which at that time was the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. And he got all of us together and we became the number seven branch of ITGWU, of which I'm still a member. And the, um, although lodged card. And um, the, he, he more or less persuaded uh, the number seven branch then, which consisted of people who worked in RTE, which was one branch, or people who worked in cinemas, which was another branch, to create the film industry section. And the film industry section, they said, uh, they, they wrote to all the agencies, in future you must use an Irish crew. Uh, one big agency says, stuff you, we're not going to do that. Um, and they were making a big Smithix commercial, and they brought in a very high profile English crew, and they were just, just going to break this, going to move. Uh, so um, they made the ad, and actually, um, ITGWU, the guys in RTE, they were told, you're not showing that commercial. But Tiernan cleverly had sort of got the story out in the papers and he'd said, you know, not using Irish crews, what's this? And Guinness started to sort of feel, well, this is not great publicity for us, you know, the brand we are, just to have all these people claiming that, you know, uh, there are film crews in Ireland who could do this and we're not using them. So the whole thing changed overnight. And there I was sitting in the next door room. And of course, like all people who work in films, they forget about the editing. So they had it all sorted out that Irish crews would do all the commercial and they suddenly realized, oops, we've got no editor. And that's part of the crew. So I was in Rory's and Tiernan uh, came over the wall and he said, look, you can cut commercials, which is actually all I had been doing in London, and said, can you do it? So I said, yes. And that really was a massive turning point because it sort of took off for me. Suddenly all this work came in and uh, I had worked for Rory. Rory wasn't really interested in that, so I decided, and this was, I suppose, big decision number two, to set up a company on my own. And I set up James Morris Editing. But I didn't do it on my own. I went back again to a friend from Trinity Days, Russ Russell, who was working at as a copywriter, um, writing commercials for, um, they were called anti-drink commercials, which was ironic, knowing who he is. But anyway, um, he gave that up. I persuaded him and said, look, why don't you come and join me? I can teach you how to edit, I, and uh, we, it's going to be great. And so we, we rented a, a muse in Herbert Lane, and uh, I went back to Andrew Vere, whose job I turned down, and said, look, I'm going to do this. Can you lend me some money or you know, blah, blah. And he did, and I borrowed 5,000 from him, and we set up the cutting room, and it did extremely well, and we had a lot of work. 
And our whole business model was, you know, in those days, Ireland never has had a film laboratory, and the whole making of commercials and TV programs were all film-based. So it was a chemical process, and laboratories were all in the UK. So the way we worked is, there were, you know, rushes, were, we had an overnight system. Again, because I had done my time in London, I knew how the labs worked, I knew who the contacts were. So I set up a one-stop shop service, and I said to everybody that I was working for in Dublin, leave it all to me, I, I'll charge you, but I'll organize the labs, I'll organize the sounds, we'll do the editing. So it was called a total post-production package. And that generated, I mean, I'll be honest, I've never done as well since. Um, it, it was an amazing 18 months. Um, at the end of which, I knew that we, you know, we, we were sort of very busy, and we had great opportunities. Uh, another. Uh, Mia Davis uh, joined, and he, uh, as a trainee, a very talented guy, and he was, um, so we were working away, and um, I suppose uh, the, the natural thing to do um, with all of that was probably to go down something more filmic, but actually what, uh, what we decided, and I think it was probably came from, from me more than the others, because I was, we were working very collaboratively, uh, we'll build a music recording studio. Um, and the reason for that was, in those days, every band in the UK that had a hit was told immediately uh, to leave the UK for tax reasons, because the tax levels were so high. So, and at the same time, having had a hit, they needed another follow-up, so they had to get into a recording studio quick. And that's one thing I knew, and that was the sort of extent of the market research. I'd reconnected with Sean, who was working his own music at that time, and he'd said there are no studios in Dublin. And so, long story short, I went down and... Um, with the sort of money we'd made, and we bought uh, number four, Windmill Lane. Now, that was a part of town that was, you know, it was the perfect place for us, the Docklands, but in those days, Docklands was deserted, it was sort of industrial, and it was very affordable. So we bought an old warehouse there, uh, and um, I approached a guy called Brian Masterson, who was working in uh, Lombard Studios and Eamon Andrews Studios. He's a great engineer, and I said, look, do you want to join us? We're going to really build a world-class studio. Going ahead and doing that, I had a sort of flaming row with Andrew Veer and the English backers because they didn't think this was sensible at all. We managed to resolve that, and uh, out of that came uh, Maurice Russell-Avis. Russ and me had said, look, we're definitely on board for this, and Wimbledon Recording Studios. And so we were able to build, uh, we, we got in touch. Brian was the sort of, and also actually my brother Tim, who worked in London at the time, came back because he was absolutely kind of mad about music, and he and Brian were the two guys who got the music studio built. We went to a man called John Storick, who uh, was a famous music studio designer in the States. Um, and we kind of did our homework, in other words. John Storick had built Electric Ladyland uh, and in New York and Criteria Studios, which were absolute hit factories. And he came across here. And we got on quite well, and he sort of did a design for us. And I had a, lo a, a local architect, a friend, <coughs> Michael Collins. I said, look, we need a project manager and architect, but you give us the designs. And he had all sorts of things like we had to have, you know, it was, the studio was about as big as this hall here, and it was, you know, at the high end, you know, where you had orchestra. We, it was, in those days, it was called acoustic design in an open space. So you had different acoustic properties in different open areas. So all the musicians could play together, but the engineer could get separation uh, on, the, on the 24 track, was the thinking. And he was able to do that, and he said, but one key thing in his design is you've got to have Hawaiian lava rock there, which was going to cost more than the whole studio budget. Uh, so uh, Michael said, well, do you, I, wh why, why is that? Well, it's got a particularly, you know, reflects sound, and it's also, uh, you can't have parallel surfaces in the studio, so all the angles in all directions have got to be at an angle, otherwise you get standing waves, which creates distortion. So he explained all this to us, and then Michael said, well, would bricks do? He says, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> we went with bricks. Um, but we built the studio, and um, so anyway, we... We kind of, um, you know, it broadly worked. Uh, the bands, we, we, we just made a few phone calls to record companies and we said this, but the main thing was actually the local music scene. There were so many musicians around and it was a very fertile time. And uh, and very early stage, kind of three things happened really. One is that Paul McGuinness, you know, wandered in, who again, we had been students together, we have been friends, and he, um, he started off in the film industry, by the way. He started off as an assistant director. He used to work with Tiernan. So we were all sort of buzzing around doing that, and he decided then he was going to manage a band. And he came and he said, look, I've got this band, you two. Can I rent some rooms? Yes, and we're going to make our first album here. So, you know, that obviously, you know, in hindsight, 
that put Windmill Lane Studios on the map. But at the early stages, that's that's what it was. It was just you know uh, these guys, Paul, who I knew extremely well from our old student days, and uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, we got plenty of space down here. So that happened. And the other big thing that happened is that MTV started. It kicked off in Europe, and suddenly every band needed a video. And we were a fairly unique establishment in that there was a recording studio on the ground floor and a film company above. By the circumstances I've just explained, but uh, so there, you know, suddenly bands came in and said, "Oh, can you do videos?" And yes, we can. So Mirt, um, very talented guy, he started. He directed Gloria, which is U2's first video, which was done down the canal docks. We had a budget of about 500 pounds or something, and we he started. He became. A, he now lives in Los Angeles. He became a really big um, sort of pop promo director, and and we. But we went into a period then in the mid 80s, we were doing promos. We set up a company in Los Angeles with, in partnership with a company called Midnight Films, a friend, Michael Hamlin, who had been, uh, who was a UK based. And so we set up Windmill Midnight, Mayot went over there. And, uh, and that was a great run of, of, apart from the fact that you two were making albums and videos, we were doing videos for a lot of other people as well. So that, it all sounds like it's, it's sort of easy and false, but, uh, but actually, I suppose these things happened over quite a long period of time. But Mayot's talent is what drove that. He got his chance doing you two videos. And we just happened to get the right things in the right place for that period of time. Um, the other thing that happened was technology. Having started the whole thing on film and having run a business based on film, video came along, uh, and in particular what's called one-inch uh, video. So suddenly video editing, instead of being a sort of, you know, on the fly, sort of press the button and hope, or live mixing, you could actually could do kind of considered editing offline and online editing. Again, I'm sure you all take that for granted now. You can more or less do it on your iPhone. But at that time, you were using things called umatic tapes. Uh, but we set up a video facility, and that gave us a complete amount of um, independence. We no longer had this dependence on UK laboratories, and we went in to do uh, sort of the, a total package from Dublin. So um, I suppose, you know, that, that obviously quite a lot happened, but a lot of the opportunities um, that we had um, and built up our sort of, you know, through commercials and pop programs in Munich, other things were going on in Dublin, and uh, one of the major ones was John Borman and the National Film Studios, uh, and then Neil Jordan came along and to direct his first film, Angel. And because it was quite a small community, there were plenty of um, people who, you know, we all kind of knew each other, and we were asked to, to work on Angel, and we, we did a little bit on that, but it, it was a sort of parallel thing going on. Um, and then for us, and I, I suppose just to say, you know, in, in all of these things, you know, I, I've always worked in collaboration. So although, it, although I've been asked to sort of talk about myself, I mean, whether it was setting up with Russ, getting me it, or working with other people, everything, I've, I always like working in collaboration where you have, you know, like-minded people and, you know, you have different ideas, plenty of disagreements, but it's just a great environment to work in. It doesn't always work out doing it with friends, but, um, you know, that, that's just how it kind of worked. So then, uh, I suppose at a later stage, I went to, uh, looked back at London, and I, I thought, well, look, we've kind of reached a bit of a ceiling here. The music studios are doing well. But you know, apart from a small Irish films, though, and commercials going at a certain rate. So I went back to London and uh, set up a few companies, actually. One was called Windmill Munro Design, which was based around a guy called Andy Munro, who was an acoustic designer we'd met, and a guy called um, Jim Butler, who was, uh, who was our engineer and a technical whiz in Dublin, put them together to say, architecture and technology, we can build great studios for you. And it sort of worked, but it didn't work in the end. Um, the main thing that worked was um, getting together. Again, I went to Paul and others, and we set up a company in the mill uh, in London called The Mill, which was based on the idea of Windmill Lane, which was a creative post-production company. Um, and it, was, it, it opened in 1990. It was backed financially by... Uh, myself, uh, Paul, and you two, uh, and we, um, I suppose, again, a sort of a, a long run up to this, but uh, the way that happened is I had met two very talented artists, uh, you know, a, a, a CG, an animator, and a, and a compositor. Uh, Ian Pearson was the main one. Ian had been famous for doing a video, it looks really clunky now, but it was the Dire Straits Money for Nothing video, which was the first fully computer animated uh, music video. So I met him and we just talked about how digital technology was replacing video and we had an opportunity to build a facility which is 100% digital and also targeting 100% commercials because this is the background I'd come from. So um, 
I kind of, I suppose, through him I met then Robin Shanfield and Pat Joseph. Uh, they were the guys running a post-production company in London which was part of Virgin and Branson's empire called Rushes. So I persuaded them to come uh, and we've, I, I suppose what I, my role in this was I formed a, very, a really formidable team, brought them together, brought the money together and the company set up in 1990. Um, it has gone on since I, I then spent you know, 10, 12 years commuting backwards and forwards. The mill had a, you know, from being an original kind of commercials only, uh, it was a pretty big deal. Uh, it was seen as sort of, not, you know, not the way to do things in London because up until then, post was very much you have to do a bit of programming, a bit of promos, a bit of everything to make it work. Whereas we just went down one to be specialists, and particularly in what we, you know, what was then became visual effects, which is sort of high end commercials. So um, the company, anyway, it worked. Uh, and then in 98, we, were, uh, we approached Ridley Scott and Tony Scott, who had just bought Shepparton Studios to set up Mill Film. And so they came on board, and Mill Film became uh, the, you know, the first of the big visual effects companies in London, won the Oscar for Gladiator. The reason for, for us talking to Ridley was you know, directorial talent opens doors in Hollywood. We had no connections there. So again, that idea worked. And then we, um, so, I suppose I was involved uh, with the mill through to about 2001, and then there was a, a, a change of ownership. Uh, Paul and U2 got their exit. They got a, a good return eventually on their investment, and a venture capitalist came on board. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and it's now a company which is, employs um, uh, just under 700 people, They're based in the UK, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. and. I have a daughter that, that works there and a son that works there in New York. Um, I'm not part of it anymore. I, I kind of sold my last interest back in 2011. Um, and I, I would say that, although I, you know, I, would, I suppose I can take credit for put, bringing the pieces together that got it started, there's no question in my mind that Robin Shanfield and Pat Joseph have been the driving force behind making it the worldwide success and the class company it is. It's an extraordinary operation. So, and, and that all came from, you know, I suppose I'm trying to make this a bit of a story you know, from the things we did back in Dublin. So anyway, back in Dublin, uh, there was a thing that happened in October 1989. There was a full page ad in the Irish Times which advertised for applicants to start uh, Ireland's third national terrestrial television channel. And I faithfully made the comment uh, in-house with uh, Russ and Miet. I said, this is too good an opportunity to miss your own TV channel. I mean, so... <laughs> um, Anyway, that began a bit of a saga, uh, which I'll just tell you briefly about, because time is flying, I haven't realized. But anyway, I, I put together a thing called the Windmill Consortium. We had sort of the great and the good, and we made an application, and we were awarded the license. There was one other consortium that backed out at the last minute, which we discovered was run by Tony O'Reilly. We were backed. The consortium, what you do is you go and you get people with money and people with connections. You bring them all together, you tell them it's fantastic, and you get them to put their name to it, and you go and you try and win the license. And so it, that design kind of worked, really. And we, we did win it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the authorities at the time, the Department of Communications, hadn't actually worked out how to give us frequencies to transmit and be a TV channel. There was this massive technical delay then from March 1989 until February 1992. I, I had, you know, we had to hold this idea of a consortium that we would be a TV channel together over this period. Obviously, faith in it was not great. The whole thing was seen as a bit of a loser. Um, but anyway, we got frequencies uh, in February, and then um, we were uh, in May. We were we had to represent our plans. They were approved, and we were given to the end of August uh, to come back and raise the money. And that should have been it. And this was in 1992. Uh, anyway, in July, having just gone on the road uh, to raise the money, the then Minister of Communications announced that he was changing the Broadcasting Act. And so our fundraisers rang me and said, look, uh, James, we have to withdraw our fundraising document because it no longer states the truth of the market and the circumstances and the environment that you're asking investors to, to back. So our sort of a whole fundraising was sort of literally kind of came to a complete halt overnight with the announcement that the Broadcasting Act was going to change and fundamentally change what is a regulated environment for anybody who operates in it. Um, I went and spoke to the minister and I said, well, you're the minister, you're entitled to do whatever you like, but obviously we're in the middle of a, a, you know, a pretty important um, project for us. Uh, can you at least sort of tell the regulator to press the pause button because they've given us a deadline to the end of August to raise the money? He said, I can't interfere with an independent regulator. So then it became a sort of a big cat and mouse, uh, which ended up in a big row whereby 
the, the regulator, which is the IRTC, is now the BAI, took our license away. That triggered overnight examinership in Windmill Lane, the company that I'd originally just told you the story about, because realistically, um, w you know, we had backed this prospect of TV3 completely. Uh, you know, everything was on the success of this thing happening now. And when the license is taken away, that asset on your balance sheet disappears. It becomes a liability. So uh, <laughs> the, that, that was on a Tuesday. On the Wednesday night, the, the, I had been booked to appear on the, a big chat about the future of broadcasting called What's on the Box. And um, so I decided I would do it anyway. And sort of RTE and UTV and everybody connected <coughs> with broadcasting were all... So I went into this uh, RTE studio, and I don't know if you've ever walked into a room, I recommend it, and you can just feel everybody backing off <laughs> away from you, because this was a kind of a bit of an overnight sensation, you know, the license taken away. And I knew the next morning we'd be down in the High Court seeking protection of the court because we were, you know, we were insolvent by virtue of the asset TV3 being written off. So um, anyway, uh, that all happened, and we, I kind of explained why I still thought TV3 was a really good idea. But didn't look at much at the time, and um, went to the High Court. And what that means is, examinership basically means that you, you, if you're successful, it means that your business is basically a good, sound business, but you have reached, you know, something has happened that has put the whole business in jeopardy, and the court decides whether it's worth saving it or not. In America, they call it Chapter 11. In here, people confuse it with receivership. In fact, when we went down, the 6 o'clock news, the headline, now, you know, you can judge whether it was the most important national event of the day, was the examinership of Wynne Lane. Uh, first item on the six o'clock news. So I did ring the director general and I said, look, we're not in receivership, we're in examinership. But people didn't really know what that was. And you know, you're not really helping. In fairness, they took it off. So um, what happens in examinership is that everything you have is wiped out. Um, and you have to get new investors and you have to raise new money. Uh, I managed to uh, get some backers. It was pretty difficult uh, because we were a headline disaster. Um, but uh, persuaded for, uh, you know, what they call high net worth individuals. Um, to, and my, my sales pitch was, look, um, I'm only asking you this because I, I feel you can afford to lose it. And two, um, I promise that, you know, if you do back this, I think we are a viable business, but I won't be coming back looking for more. Anyway, long story short, they did. I managed to get it through. All the creditors, including the Revenue Commissioners, supported the scheme of arrangement which the court put forward because there was a sort of a general understanding that the business was sound, but uh, you know, you could say it had been a mistake, and it was entirely my mistake, by the way. And it resulted in me splitting up with Russ and Meert. Uh, Russ went off to form his own production company, Meert, in LA. It's a pretty um, sort of unhappy result from their point of view. Um, so it was kind of back, to, you know, start all over again. I you know, had to kind of keep going to London because the commitment there was so huge in terms of personal guarantees. I had to do that. And so we rebuilt the company, but then the next thing was um, uh, we sought, uh, we, t we, we took the IRTC to the High Court uh, uh, and on the grounds of breach of natural justice. And again, just to speed this up, uh, we, the, the chairman of the, uh, of the regulator, the IRTC, was actually an ex-Supreme Court judge, Seamus Henshi. And we had a senior counsel called Mary Finlay, who was brilliant, and she sort of, first thing she said to me, you do realize Seamus Henshi is one of the three greatest judges the state has ever had, i.e., so what kind of a fool are you to try and take this man to court? Anyway, I told the story, and she said, well, I, we, I think we have a case. Uh, so we took it, and we won. And, we, and it, it was then appealed by the regulator to the Supreme Court. And it went before the Supreme Court to review that judgment. And he fired his senior counsel and put in Michael McDool, who referred to us as the remnants of the TV3 consortium, the way lawyers talk. Uh, and, he said, and he said, I'm instructed by uh, my client to inform you, the Supreme Court, that regardless of what decision you make, this consortium will never get a license, um, which is a pretty remarkable thing to say. Uh, and then Mary Finley got up and she said, well, I, I, I want to treat this uh, you know, court, obviously, with total respect, but as it happens, the precedents I must put forward for you, which justify this ruling and support my client, are judgments that were made, of course, by Seamus Henshi. So um, that all came to a conclusion. The license, we won in the Supreme Court. They gave us the license back. Uh, and there was a failed attempt to get the thing up and running with the backing of UTV, which is interesting to see them back now. Um, and uh, Canadians came on board, CanWest, who were absolutely brilliant. And they backed it. And it went on air in 1998. So, so that's a sort of, I mean, you know, from about, I, I, I'm going to speed it up now. I knew I'd take far too long on all this. I mean, you know, since then, I, you know, I've sort of 
my time in the mill came to an end. It's now owned by others. Robin and Pat still run it. It's still a brilliant company. We did sell TV3 in the end, me and my promoters who'd started all the original consortium, and we did very well. We sold it to Doughty Hanson, so that had a happy ending. And I, I spend my time now. I came back here full time in uh, 06, I think, and um, uh, Windmill is still my day job, as Marie says. You know, my project at the moment is to get a visual effects company up and running. Visual effects, so you, you all know what that is. You know, it's, it's, com it's basically photo real CGI combined with, you know, well, photo real. So you know, sort of super real imagery gravity, blah, blah, and all that. But we can do it here now. Uh, it's, uh, we're coming to it late in the day, the three or four companies. We formed the Visual Effects Association of Ireland. There is a page about it on the web, and uh, there's a VFX summit coming up at the weekend. We're participating in all of that. And it's a, real, you know, it's a real opportunity to get something going on that front. It's kind of what we did when I had a bit of involvement with in London, but it's such a changed environment now, completely different. Technology's different, talent. But the underlying talent and creativity is still absolutely the same. And it, it, is, it is actually, um, I think, a real uh, area that we can excel in here in Ireland. So, uh, and then I have another project I can't tell you about. But <laughs> cause, um, which, which uh, those are the ones that often never happen. So, look, I, I, just to tie this back, I mean, uh, I've, I've avoided introspection, but, uh, you know, I did think TCD gave me the foundation. I did, I learned how to express myself and be, you know, reasonably persuasive in writing, and I know I got that from studying history. But I think most of all, it taught me, to, you know, apart from thinking clearly, I didn't realize it at the time, I think it taught, you know, uh, you know it's, it's about absolute and rigorous standards and trying, and trying for, and second, you know, second best isn't, you know, it just doesn't work. You really have to try and make things the best you possibly can. And I think that was just a lesson I picked up here from Trinity. And if Trinity stands for anything, I think it does stand for excellence. And that doesn't change, despite attempts at rebranding. Oops. So, <laughs> uh, ironically, the buildings, we sold the buildings uh, back in, in, of Windmill Lane. Uh, that I sold the music studios to Brian. He went down to Ring's End in 1990. Those buildings are, uh, you know, the new owners, which is a uh, Hibernia Real, Real Estate Investment Trust now owns that whole block. We sold it actually not because the land was valuable, but it was valuable, but, but because the buildings had become impossible to work in. You know, there were six old buildings, uh, fire regulations, rain coming in. It was going to cost a fortune to do. So we decided to sell it to a developer, and we've moved back to Herbert Lane, which is the same road I started off back in 1979. And uh, that's where the company is now. Uh, we employ about 100 people. And uh, I'm totally, anything I'm doing is, you know, has always been, you know, for or with Windmill. I, it's too complicated to try and have lots of different sort of unconnected relationships in business. And um, so uh, the buildings, I suspect, are going to be uh, knocked in the next few months, which is interesting to, to live to see all that, because there was a, a great life there uh, in the 80s, particularly when a lot of great things happened. And then, and so there we are. That's so. Uh, what I've told you is, I think, uh, uh, stories beginning. I don't know about how the ideas developed. I, I suppose you've got some idea there. Um, I haven't done this before. I don't plan to do it again. <laughs> um, but uh, and I sort of put this together fairly rapidly. So I hope it's been interesting or uh, whatever. But um, if you have, I've been on far too long. Um, that, was, that was really incredible, James. Um, and I wonder if anybody has any questions that they'd like to, to ask him. <laughs> no, look, we have, uh, we have something here called a catch box, which is, uh, I can throw it to you, and then when you hold it, it will work as a microphone. <laughs> I'll take an hour to sort out. Thanks, Mary. Uh, James, thank you for an excellent speech. I really thank enjoyed you. that. Oh, I, really I can hear you. <laughs> Yeah. What? Um, what was interesting in your talk is that you uh, very accurately pinpointed the fact that you were on the cusp of the right time, the right idea. Part of that was your experience in, in the UK of bringing it back here. Yeah. It's okay. It's great. And um, I think that it wasn't just fortuitous, but it was also the fact that you were embedded into a circle, into a network of like minded people who were yeah. interested in doing things. And I was just curious, I, I, I think you pinpointing, um, you know, CGI and visual effects as a, as a new kind of yeah. product. What are the kind of projections into the more longer term future that you would see emerging that Dublin would have a potential in developing? Um, 
I, I failed to mention, I did a, a, the last eight years, I, I, I served as the chair of the Irish Film Board, uh, which, which actually really reconnected me back to all, kind of the whole industry. And from that perspective, I'm going to, anybody who knows what I did there, essentially I think that we have all of the, the dots that if they're joined up will, uh, is, is people call the creative industries. I think that film uh, and things like VFX and animation are very much at the heart of it. Just to put that in perspective, the UK have been, have been defining the creative industries and building them up to the extent that the creative industries in the UK now represent 7% of UK GDP, which is equivalent to the entire financial services city of London. It's cited by Gordon Brown, it's cited by George Osborne as the two, if you like, pillars of growth for the United Kingdom are the creative industries and their strength in science. We don't have a strategy, a national strategy for the creative industries. We have the arts uh, and we have communications. Uh, and we have technology and IT. Uh, but re in reality, the creative industries draw on all of those. Uh, as ultimately, our artistic, our cultural, and our creative credentials are the most valuable <coughs> thing we have. Uh, it's what drives the creative industries in the UK. It's what will future-proof us against businesses that come here that will then migrate elsewhere. Because we do have an extraordinary, we have, first of all, we have a worldwide reputation, which none of us earned, but previous generations did, writers and playwrights and artists. Um, for artistic and creative excellence. That, that is such an amazing starting off point. And so I am an optimist, obviously, as you can see. But I do think that um, getting sort of policy, and I try to work you know, you know, down these tracks. Uh, and I think an institution like Trinity is a huge part to play in that in terms of understanding the dynamics of how individuals with talent need to sort of organize themselves probably not in permanent organizations, but in forms of alliances that allow things to happen. And that the things that make things happen need to be enabled by resources. Um, I mean, some of the best stuff that's going on is usually happening in the cheapest, uh, crappiest part of town, isn't it? Because that's where sort of new ideas and artists can afford to work. You can't afford you know, expensive places. So um, we're close, I think, to having um, and th there's a new Section 481 tax credit coming in in January, which is very quite contentious with people in the film industry because some people were wedded to an old one. But I think this is going to be a big uh, boost to kind of new production. It's going to bring some of the biggest content creators in the world to be producing film and drama now and on a continuous long-term basis. And if that happens, and just all that goes with that in terms of directors, artists, art directors, talent, actors, and all of these things intermingling with what we already have, we did a survey. When I started in the industry, there were 600 people working there. Sorry, in, sorry, in 1992, when I started, there were far less, independently. In 08, we did a survey when I was on the film board. There were 6,000 people. So policy has worked. It, it's, you know, it's not a huge industry, but it actually is the same size, scale, and value as the entire Irish marine sector. And when you put it in those contexts, that we are moving towards something much more substantial. Sorry for the long answer, but it's a good question. <laughs> going on in Ireland between creative industries and what would be the cultural and the arts sector. Yeah. And so like the creative industries have been active here for 20, 30 years as you identified. So what you're saying is that there just hasn't been an integration of the industrial side of the... the, the not, not in a conscious, deliberate way. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you've got to decide where you draw the circle. When Indeed. the UK, they, they include design, architecture, um, theatre, art. So it's all the creative and artistic uh, endeavours and enterprises. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Do you want to throw it over there? Yeah. No? Somebody your aim, right? Okay, I'm looking at it. Thanks. Hi. I just wanted to ask you about um, your collaborations. You seem to always team up with people. Mm. And what are the characteristics you're looking for in a person, their personal qualities that you look for? Uh, well, enthusiasm. Uh, you've got to have the shared enthusiasm. You've got to really want to do it. And then I think complementary. Uh, you know, they say, you know, if two people agree all the time, one of them isn't necessary. So uh -huh. it, it's, it, it is a question of finding people who challenge you. Uh, so, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, I, I, I know everyone says it, but actually that is how it works in my experience. Thank you. Enthusiasm. Thank you. <laughs> we have one down in the front. Um, Oh, no, first. Whoa. <laughs> okay. 
It's running a guy. Just a quick question. Um, the creative industries, we talk about industries that are notoriously difficult to get into, to yeah. make a start, in, to, to progress yeah. within. Um, specifically, do you think a recording studio is a viable business opportunity or idea presently, given the advances in technology and the changing nature of the industry? Yeah, you know, a, a recording studio, pure and simple, was never that viable. But it's a great uh, platform. It, it led us into videos. The thing about a recording studio on its own is that recording technology is now ubiquitous. Um, and the reason that we, we sold the studios in 1990 is because everyone, you know, U2 had their own studio. They went to record it in location in Slane and places like that. So everybody decided that the, what we had built was no longer really fit for purpose. I think recording music is a, definitely a viable you know, it's an environment, isn't it? If you can put together a place, a space where, you know, encourages creativity and you know, that kind of uh, atmosphere is real, uh, you will attract musicians that in turn will kind of attract attention. And, but, but, you know, we, we never, I suppose, if, 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 if my accountant was here, you'd say we never made a penny out of a recording studio, but we did make uh, out like bandits with videos. Thanks. Yep. Right. Mm. Hi. Um, perhaps more a personal question rather than professional. You know, last year the Science Gallery did a wonderful exhibition called Fail Better. And it was in relation to, I suppose, what we perceive failure to be and actually how it can be a positive rather than a negative. And in your early days, you know, you collaborated with friends or colleagues from Trinity like Sean, but you realised yourself that perhaps it wasn't your calling. But how did you persevere to find something that was? You know, how did you not, I suppose, submit to what you perceived failure to be? You know, was it youthful exuberance? Was it naivety? Was it a vision? Well, um, largely necessity, um, which is that um, there comes a point when you can't kind of, you know, uh, rely on the folks to keep you. You know, I was very privileged. Be, that's the honest truth. You know, I was sent. To, I got a good education. I was sent to Trinity, uh, and I think that's a that is an incredible privilege. So, uh, you know, where, mostly what happens is that your enthusiasm gets you to do something, and then you're stuck with it, uh, and the consequences of that can be good or bad. And in my experience, they've been both, <laughs> frequently. Uh, and so, I, I, it's just you just have to kind of, you know, it's all self-inflicted. So you have to kind of stick with it uh, once you've decided, you know, to give something a shot. Um, and you don't contemplate failure, obviously, at the start. I mean, you recognize it when it happens, and it happens an awful lot. I, I sort of glossed over a few things, to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, there wasn't time. <laughs> so, OK. Great. Anyone else? Loads. Right. I'll go and give it a kick. This is a really like, simple person's question, but did you ever fall into that situation where you had to um, work in like a restaurant or something or just to sustain? Yeah, I did. I, uh, I had a lot of those ones. Uh, I polished cars um, and I had a job as a pheasant plucker um, <laughs> over Christmas time. I did, yeah, I did. You know, I just, well, you know, if, if there's sort of, if you have no money, I, I was lucky that way. I mean, there was always something you could do just to, my expenses were pretty low, you know? I mean, like what gets you through the things, you know, is your friends. I mean, the other thing is obviously, you know, and I, I should have mentioned this, but what gets you through everything is family. Ultimately, when I hit, hit the sort of wall with examinership and literally lost everything, you know, from a financial point of view and had massive debts, I mean spectacular debts, then, you know, it is your family that supports you. And that certainly was true with me. I mean, we actually sold the house we lived in. We lived with, we moved into Fanola's parents' house for two years, you know, at that whole time with examinership and stuff. So there is a, you know, there's, a, there's that side of life too. Um, but then, you know, we ended up finding a, you know, this is luckily before the boom, you know, we, that's sorry, the Celtic tiger. Um, anyway. Just yeah. uh, coming from someone who, who is wanting, you know, to pursue those creative endeavors, but also, yeah will need to sustain themselves financially and work perhaps in a restaurant or something of that nature. What do you think, the, the, it's sometimes it's hard to actually find the time to like yeah. commit to all yeah. of these things that you want to do because you're... I, I, I couldn't agree more and I, I think, you know, the sort of the, the effort it takes and um, I, I, I know enough, you know, I'm, I'm connected enough to know that it's a completely different world now in lots of ways, although certain things I think are, are actually the same. 
the thing to the trick is to tr is to keep trying different things in terms of your real ambition. Um, doing the work to get to achieve your ambition is just doing the work to achieve your ambition. But if something is, is not working or proving too hard and I can't get in that door, just try another one. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter which door gets you in. Once you're in, you're in. Anyone else there? Okay, yeah. come over next. Yeah. Uh, James, uh, that was fascinating. Love to hear. Um, what would you say your main skill is? To me, you <laughs> good at keeping contacts, uh, having friends, long-term friends. What would you say your main skill is? Whoa, I don't know. <laughs> good interview question. It is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose, like, I, perseverance, I suppose, I mean, I, 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 I do. But then again, you know, it's the necessity thing. I mean, people said it took 10 years to get TV3 from winning the license to getting on air. But, you know, when you're down the hole, you don't have much choice. You know, you, what are you going to do? You can't give up. Resilience? You know? Resilience? Yeah, well, you learn that along the way, you know, you sort of... I mean, there was, you know, when I was a student, I, I, I genuinely couldn't imagine a world where I'd have to get up for 10 in the morning. Hi, this, uh, this actually builds on some of the stuff that's already been asked. Um, so, like the creative industry is so really notoriously hard to get into. You know, and it's all about like who you know and what what you caught them doing. And um, how the question of free working for free comes up a lot. And kind of coming to an institution like Trinity, your the big dream is that you will never have to do a free internship. But um, yeah. a lot of the time, it's all that's on offer. How, how can you judge whether you should give away your time for free or whether you're just being taken advantage of and, and kind of where do you stand on having people work for free? Um, I, I mean, I, I do think you have to try and um, keep trying different things. Uh, I mean, I th you know, if uh, I, I, that is a real dilemma because there is <coughs> the, the, the sort of that, the world of work begins here and the end of sort of student and, you know, very qualified and, you know, postgraduate and all of those things. That world ends here. And the connect isn't a simple or easy one. You know, it, it's, it's not like becoming a lawyer or some of the other professions. How you, how you get in, you, you know, it is a bit of perseverance and a bit of luck. But I, I think, you know, you've, you've got the tools now to do the research. I don't think you need to know what you want to do ultimately. I think if you have the urge to be in the creative industries, you know, what's wrong with just trying out the first thing? And you might hate it, but you know, in that process, you'll see you'll spot something else and move in that direction. I, I think, and it isn't a race. I mean, I, I got started pretty late, you know, mainly from a desire to avoid having to do anything, you know? <laughs> Um, you were saying you did history in college, so do you find in this industry like it's more your portfolio or it's your education that will get you into these positions? You know, it, I mean, I think what you learn and what I learned has been of huge value to me, but not, not the certificate really, just the sort of experience of the discipline, in fact, you know, which I, kind of, I guess I must have picked up along the way. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, you, you do, your network does start to happen you know you only need to meet one person who leads to another thing and then that leads to two it, it could tiny steps are the ones that work it's never gonna I, well sometimes you have a complete sort of epiphany and you walk into you know being Spielberg's uh, personal assistant but it's unlikely <laughs> and in, just like in terms of when you were building business did you find your portfolio worked more for you or when you started getting like brand recognition like which kind of stood to your company more to get you in with those kind of clients, your portfolio or your? Uh, I think the two are connected. I mean, the, you know, your, you, your work is what gets you work. It's the quality of the work you do. That's the absolute most important thing. That, if you can build that into an, a brand, and we sort of did again by, I remember getting a lecture from a guy who's a kind of a brand guru, I call Bill Felton, and he, he said, you do know, I said, we need a new logo. He says, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, Windmill Lane. He says, and he's sort of shocked. He says, you do know you've got a brand, don't you? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, and, but it did sort of slowly dawn on us that we had something that, you know, and it's, it's a weird thing now, having sold the studios, somebody in completely different is sort of marketing, in a way, our history, which is an odd feeling, but there you go. We sold it. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Sorry, but... Yeah. 
Well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, James. Great. That was an amazing story. Thanks very much. Thanks for staying.